uh, greeting, kind of pulling um, those two sides together, and peace is a huge part of that. It's what the whole Old Testament pointed towards. It's what they wanted. There so, we go. Yeah. What do you think his greeting would be if he spoke English? Grace and peace. You heard it here first. <laughs> Grace and peace. Uh, and so, uh, frankly, we could start, we could go to any one of these letters that Paul wrote, because peace is just a common topic throughout each uh, of these letters, but Philippians is especially a good book because it's it's a really similar context to kind of what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, because uh, Paul is in prison at what the time of writing the letter to the Philippian church, uh, and so he can't be with them physically, and that's obviously the exact situation that we're in right now. We can't be together physically, and and he starts off and after the grace and peace, uh, he he talks about how he yearns to be together with them, how he longs to be in that uh, in that church in that city with them, um, thriving, uh, striving forward uh, for the gospel together. But he can't be with them, and so he's writing this letter to them. And so uh, this setting is actually really familiar to us right now. Um, so Paul has some words of encouragement for his people, um, because his people are freaking out uh, that, that their their church plant, their pastor, uh, Paul, is in prison. Uh, they don't know if he's going to make it out. Uh, this isn't some cushy prison, uh, like house arrest, like Martha Stewart type stuff. <laughs> this is like, this is legit prison, uh, like dungeon style prison. He just, he's not sure if he's going to make it out. It's prison, prison. Not sure. it's prison prison. Prison Mike prison. Prison Mike prison. The Dementors are going to get him, okay? <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, that's not true, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was prison-like prison, that's for um, sure. Yeah, and so Paul in, in, encourages the Philippian church and us today as to how we can experience peace in the middle of craziness and a peace that surpasses even common sense, a peace that surpasses understanding. And so today, we hopefully can be encouraged as to how we can have peace in our time of pandemic. Yeah, so go ahead and grab your Bible and read along with us. It's uh, Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 4 and read through verse 7. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now those words are incredibly, were incredibly relevant. If, Matt, if what Matt said was true about that time frame with what Paul was feeling and what the church was feeling at that time with uh great tribulation around them and pandemonium, uh, fear and anxiety, these words are really striking. Mm. But what's really interesting is that we um, find ourselves in that same situation. I think these words speak very clearly to us as well. Paul didn't write to that church and say, uh, you know, I'm about to die. Everyone just go home and be afraid. He didn't write, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of reasons to be scared, so let's just sit here and mope about it. No, he uses the word rejoice. Mm. And he doesn't just use it one time, he says it twice, and he says always. And so, if you've been in my youth group before, you've, this is like beating a dead horse, you've heard this all the time. If anything is repeated in the Bible, it means it's bold, right? If, any, if a phrase is repeated in the Greek and Hebrew, it's bold. it's bold. It's even bolded in my notes, because it's important. Uh, rejoice. Rejoice always. Now, obviously, this comes uh, from the word joy. Uh, which is the defining mark for a believer. And it isn't joy about your circumstances, it's joy about Jesus. Uh, re rejoice in the Lord always. There's a placement for that. And so this joy isn't coming from some self-produced happiness, it's something that comes from thinking about Jesus. And so it's supposed to be the underlining um, element of how we think, how we feel, and what we do as Christians. It sets us apart. And now this isn't just saying to have this joy, it's, it's actually saying to be moved out of this joy. Out of this joy, it says rejoice. Yeah. Now Paul doesn't just say this one time, it's actually in these four short chapters, he repeats the word joy 16 times, yeah. which means it's extremely important. And I would actually say that uh, joy isn't just important to Paul, it's actually the framework of the entire gospel. It's a gift to us. And if you read it actually in other Paul's letters, you'll realize that it's actually a spiritual gift that's given to us. 
I think it's a, um, a helpful distinction that a lot of Christians, you've probably heard this before, that there's a distinction between happiness and joy, right? Happiness is this fleeting feeling that we try and gain from different pleasures in the world, but joy is something that's eternal. But I think that's sometimes a hard thing to grasp and understand, and I think we treat joy the same way we treat happiness, as if it's an emotion. But what Paul's saying, uh, kind of setting the stage for, for the rest of this uh, chapter, for the rest of these verses, is saying that joy is like the, the byproduct of the Spirit and something that we are to take and use to rejoice. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote this, he says, joy is never in our own power uh, and pleasure often is. And so joy, it's not something that you're trying to make up, it's something that we have as Christians because of the gospel of Jesus. If you believe that Jesus has saved you through his death and resurrection, and actually believe that when you die, that you too will be resurrected, that's a source of joy. That's actually the source of joy, and it's a joy that's certain. And so this command here isn't have joy, it's rejoice. Take that joy and like share it, uh, proclaim it, talk about it. And the same is true for us right now. In the middle of this pandemic, I think joy is a thing that feels lacking. Happiness surely is. But Christians, we have this underlying truth that we get to depend on in times of uncertainty and chaos and pandemonium. We have a joy. And so sing praises to God. Give God credit uh, where it's due. Talk about him. Read about him. Sing about him. That's what we're supposed to be doing in moments like this. And that's the first part. Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to look uh, at the next verse, uh, Paul keeps going and he says in verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, period. The Lord is at hand. Um, and so Paul tells us to let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And this uh, this is actually something that was kind of confusing for each of us, actually. We were trying to figure out kind of what this means. We, we had a chat on the phone and we were trying to figure out what each other thought about it. Um, and, and I think I think we've come to a place where we understand kind of what Paul is talking about. Um, and Paul is telling them... Um, to, to be reasonable in times of craziness. And now that seems really difficult, right? That seems really, um, really difficult. I don't know how to do that. Let's just think of an example. If, if a sibling or a parent is, uh, had a, has a big health scare and they're in the back of an ambulance and they're on their way to a hospital, it would be, it would be really diff difficult to be reasonable in that time. You're probably, um, some people, you, you, they might freeze up. They might, they might literally freeze up. This would be my, my wife, Kara, if something happened, uh, she would freeze up. She wouldn't know what to do. Others would would try to help, but it's they like would fight or flight, right? Yeah, fight yeah. or flight. Yeah. Others would try to help, but they wouldn't know quite what to do. And really, there's nothing you can do if if a loved one is in the back of an ambulance. You just kind of have to. Well, you actually really you can't do anything. You just kind of have to follow them, um, and, and then be with them in the hospital. Uh, and so it's it's a really difficult thing to be reasonable in kind of chaotic circumstances. And, and so Paul is telling us. Uh, that somehow, as our world is crashing down, we have to be reasonable in the middle of that. And so what I think we see in that next period, that, that little after, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, at the next sentence, I think, is why we can demonstrate this reasonableness, this gentleness, this meekness in the middle of craziness. So why can we be reasonable? Uh, why should we let, or why can we be reasonable in times of chaos? Because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. We can rejoice in all circumstances and we can be reasonable even in the worst of situations because the Lord is near to us. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is close. He is near to you and, and really he's uh, the one guiding and, and directing all of the world. Uh, I just realized this but the beginning is like you know, rejoice in the Lord because of what he's done. So you not, not only do you get to take comfort from the fact that he's done something, but the fact that he's close to you specifically. Yeah. Not just this church here, the Lord is near to us. Yeah. I think that's powerful. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, there's a verse in Deuteronomy that I really like, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, uh, verse 14, that kind of talks a little bit more about this. It, it helps give us a little bit more explanation as to what's going on. Uh, Moses uh, is who we think wrote Deuteronomy. He writes, uh, he writes this, Behold to the Lord your God, behold to the Lord your God belong the heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth with all that is in it. The, the Lord is at hand because everything that exists, everything that has ever existed, everything that will ever exist 
uh, down to even the speck of dust in this living room right now belongs to the Lord. There's Everything. a lot of, it, There's yeah. a lot of dust. Although we did just clean. We it's just like on the walls. Yeah. Uh, well, this bachelor's basements just don't look that great. Everything is his. Even like, what are the heaven of heavens, Devin? What are the heavens of heavens? What do you mean? Do you know what that is? Where, where God dwells. The heaven of heavens. Yeah. Even the heaven of heavens, whatever that means, <laughs> if that's what heaven means, or if that's what heaven said, even that belongs to the Lord. The I think he's using this kind of as an illustration. Everything, even uh, the heaven of heavens or the, 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 the deepest parts of the earth belong to the Lord. It's all his mm -hmm. and the Lord is at hand. And so that's why we can be reasonable in times of chaos because the Lord is near to us and he is working. Uh, and, and one other thing that I think that this brings up um, is that because everything is the Lord's, because the Lord is at hand, because he is working... Now, we need to be reasonable in the value that we ascribe to certain things on this earth. Because if, if you're, like, picture if you're on a boat and you're greatly moved and shaken by the waves of the world, whether it's good news or bad news, if you're, if you're greatly swayed from one side to another, um, that, then what it, that, that probably means is you're placing your trust in those things rather than the God who directs the waves, really. Um, and, and so uh, the more value we place on certain things in this world, really, the less reasonable we are because we ascribe trust to those things rather than God. And so um, when I was back in high school, and Devin knows this well because I was a student when this was going on, uh, back when I was in high school, I used to uh, buy and sell really nice sneakers. Uh, hey, you had a pair that you uh, got Yeah, I'm wearing some right up there. I took them off, though. Uh, uh, I used to... Like I do not, yeah. Uh, I used to buy and sell like new Jordans that would come out and new Kobe's that would come out, all that different stuff. And what actually ended up happening is it didn't actually make me money because I just spent all of the money that I made on more shoes for myself. Um, and so I would, but what ended up happening is my closets would begin to get fuller and fuller of shoes, but the same pairs of like three or four shoes I would wear every day because what actually ended up happening is I didn't want to ruin the worth of those shoes. And so they would just sit in the closet, uh, one time, a friend, uh, Evan Fitzpatrick, caught me in the car at church uh, with a shoebox because I had brought shoes. I didn't want to wear them while I was driving. I brought them, and so I put them on right before I walked in. Uh, really dumb, right? Really stupid. Uh, and I put so much worth on these shoes that really it, it kind of brought, uh, on a serious note, it brought me anxiety when somebody would like step on them or if I would wear them and we had to do something like outside or something like that. Uh, and so the, the value that I placed on those things consumed my thoughts. And so mm -hmm. some people say like the way uh, out of anxiety and fear, uh, what Devin's going to talk about in just a minute, is uh, to be a, a really a, be a really big planner and to, to really think about the things that you um, are doing. But really what actually tends to happen is those things actually tend to make you more anxious because the more worth you place on something and the more time you put into something, yeah. usually the more anxious and fearful you get about those things. And so Paul tells us to let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord is at hand and we can trust that the Lord is working even in the times of chaos and pandemic. Yeah, so we started with this idea of joy, uh, that we're to rejoice out of that joy uh, because of what Jesus has done. We moved on to this idea that um, this command that he gives that we're to be reasonable because the Lord is with us, the Lord is near to us. And I think it, what Matt said is true, and I think it, it's really important before we talk about the next thing, uh, to understand that concept that what we put our value in is extremely important as Christians. Yeah. If we truly value the world over Jesus, or, or the circumstances of the world over Jesus, we are doomed. Happiness is fleeting, and joy is not gonna happen. Yeah. But if we value Jesus, more than the world or the circumstances of the world, then joy is certain and happiness is a byproduct. And, and there's, so there's this quote, I forget who it's from, sorry to interrupt. You're good. Uh, um, I forget who said it, but the, the more, the things you give yourself to are the things that you become. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, do you know who said that? No. <laughs> I, I forget who said it, but the more, the things you give yourself to is the person you become. And so if you're giving yourself over to these worldly things, that's the person you're going to become. And if you give yourself over to Jesus, oftentimes uh, the little things begin to take care of themselves yeah. uh, and we can focus more and become people more like Jesus. Yeah, and the Bible talks a lot about having a foot in two worlds and not yeah. a good thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, as Christians, we need to make Jesus our everything. Uh, we need to put him as uh, our object of worship. And I think a lot of things get in the way of that. Yeah. But it's very important to know that before jumping into this next verse. Yeah. Uh, but this next verse says this. Uh, so we have the first two commands. Here's the third one. Uh, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, such an interesting phrase, and if Paul were to come and say that today, I think people would be really upset with him. Yeah. Such an easy phrase to say in this day and age, but such a hard thing to put into practice. Uh, but let's think about the way Paul meant it. Uh, he's actually talking, he's actually rephrasing what Jesus said uh, in, into a command. But the way Jesus phrased it was that you don't have to be anxious about anything. And the way Jesus says it, it wasn't a command, it was an invitation to come away from your anxiety, come away from your fear, because with me, there is nothing to fear. If you think about it, fear with Jesus, if you're his disciple, this does not make sense. It's illogical because he, Jesus is God. He has everything in control. Not only does he have everything in control, he was a part of creating all those things and planning all those things out. And so to be afraid next to Jesus is irrational. And, and so what Jesus did is he invited his disciples to come away from that fear. My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Uh, to be to be lifted from that fear. And so what Paul does is he says, don't be anxious because there's no reason to be anxious. And so uh, if we have faith in Jesus, uh, we can't have fear. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And it, it, sometimes we do. I mean, sometimes I'm afraid yeah. and sometimes it's irrational, but faith and fear are at war with each other. And fear is not supposed to be a part of our faith. We're supposed to move away from that. Now, Paul could have just said, don't be anxious and moved on. But Paul actually gives us a pattern here. He says, do not be anxious, but instead pray. Bring that to God. And, he, and this is what he says. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication is like asking for something. So prayer and asking with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, Paul, um, you know, could have just said that one command, don't be afraid, don't be anxious, but he gives us something else. He says, pray instead, ask God. And so when you feel anxious, do you pray? When you fear, fear fearful, is that your first response? We Christians aren't supposed to be quarantined in our home, sitting here afraid, not doing anything. Yeah. We're supposed to be quarantined in our homes because we're following the law of the land, but we're supposed to be praying. Yeah. And, I, and I am totally guilty of this. I think I spend way more time reading articles, watching the news, talking to my friends about how crazy this is mm -hmm. than actually asking God to be a part of it and actually asking how, what God wants to do uh, with us uh, while we're a part of this as well. And so don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. Do you guys see the, um, the, how those are next to each other, the contrast that makes? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. And so if you're asking yourself right now as a Christian, what am I supposed to be doing in this situation? This speaks towards that. It's included in that anything and everything, right? Don't be anxious about this situation. But in this situation, be prayerful about it. Ask God for things uh, and make that known to him. He wants to hear from you. And so if you were to rate your anxieties and your, and your uh, fears and you put that next to prayer, think about that. Do I go to God in prayer when I feel fearful and anxious? Uh, and I think the majority of us, including me, would say, I, I don't do that often. It's a really cool pattern that Paul gives us, especially in moments like this. So. I think there's one really key distinction. I think you would agree with this. Um, I think when I pray in times of anxiety or nervousness, I often pray for those things to be removed. Mm -hmm. When really, that doesn't seem to work. Um, we pray not to ask God to take our anxieties away. We pray, and that is the process by which our anxieties yeah. are taken away. And actually, that fits the theme of the whole thing, right? Yeah. It doesn't say, be joyful because your situation has caused you to be joyful. Be joyful in the Lord, right? So you have this joy despite the circumstance. You have this reasonable reasonableness despite the circumstances. You have this don't be anxious but pray despite the circumstances. And what Paul's... Paul. What Paul's going to say next, what Matt's going to talk about next I'll take, too, I'll take Paul. Yeah, <laughs> is this idea that there's a promise that's given to us yeah. from God. When we do those things, there's something awesome that we get to lean into instead of fear, instead of unhappiness or lack of joy. 
uh, when we lean into that joy, when we lean into that reasonableness, when we lean into uh, that prayer and in that lifestyle, God offers us peace. Yeah. And so that's this next verse. And I think that's yeah, so let's look at the last verse uh, together. Verse 7, uh, Paul writes this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so, kind of going off this, how easy is it for us, uh, in a second, for us to be peaceful one instant, and then in an instant it's gone? Uh, for me, it's really easy. I, I, I think for most of us, we would say that it's easy. Wars can take place in our, in our minds and in our hearts in just a matter of seconds. The, the, the smallest, the most insignificant thing can often set us off. Sometimes it's not even... Sometimes it could be something as small as a phrase or a word, or sometimes it's not even, yeah, like an eye roll. It doesn't even have to be a, a word. It can be a, a look that, that just sets us off uh, and, and shatters that peace that we had just seconds ago. And I think the reason why is because when we think of peace uh, in, in modern day America, 21st century, we think of peace as kind of the absence of conflict, mm -hmm. uh, the absence of war. You'll hear presidents say, uh, you'll hear people say a wartime president and a peacetime president uh, because we see that those are opposites. But what if I told you, and I think that, that Paul would, well actually, uh, Paul wouldn't agree with me, I would agree with Paul because this is the argument that Paul is making, is that peace isn't just the absence of conflict. Peace is so much more than that. For Paul, peace is something that surpasses all circumstances. It surpasses all conflicts, and he writes even that it surpasses all understanding, all common sense. It, 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 it's a peace when peace shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense to the world. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. make sense that you should have peace because peace is something that it goes beyond circumstances, all beyond situations, beyond pandemics, beyond chaos. It's something that goes beyond all of those things. It's this calm sense of uh, rest, I would say, like a mm -hmm. A restfulness, knowing, kind of what we talked about earlier, that the Lord is at hand, knowing um, that 